Hi, so we're here today in Wandsworth Park under the honey locust tree which is yet to come out but as many of you will know it looks glorious when it does and I'm with Mark from our dogs team and we're going to talk about dogs today, how we should look after our dogs and how we should ensure that the dogs are not a nuisance to other people particularly in our open spaces. So Mark, my first question for you is if somebody's looking to get a dog what sort of things should they think about? Well, there's a number of things, but the first would be, have I got time to keep a dog? Now, of course, in lockdown, everybody's had time and lots of people have got dogs. Um, but when you go back to work, is the dog going to be on its own for long periods of time? Is it going to be a nuisance? Does my landlord give permission for me to have a dog? Can I afford a dog? Um, I've got a Labrador and it costs me about £10 a week to feed and then treats on top of that. Can I afford to feed my dog as well as the family and things like that? So really the basics you've got to be thinking about before you ever look at what breed is cost and time and commitment. And as any dog owner knows out there, dogs are a lifelong commitment. You also got to think about uh, the size of your property. You know, would it be ideal to have, let's say, pick on a Rottweiler, for example, quite a large breed in the 26th floor of, of a tower block, one bedroom flat or a studio flat or something like that. Remember, you've got to get it down to get it out, to go to the toilet, and those sort of things. So you've got to think about your own environment as well. Have you got the strength to, to walk a large breed dog? You know, I'm 70 years old and I want a companion and that's wonderful. But do I get a young very sort of boisterous large breed dog or do I get an older dog perhaps from a rescue that's a bit more sedate and and a bit more used to the kind of pace that I'm going to be walking at. Well thank you Mark that, that's really interesting and particularly on, on, on the size of dog and the age of the dog because of course puppies are, are very very boisterous um, although adorable. So I said my second question is We've decided to get a dog, we're going to choose an appropriate breed, um, we are going to walk it every day and we have made arrangements for when we go back to work to ensure that its welfare is fine because obviously you cannot leave a dog for long periods of time. What do we do next? We've brought our puppy home, it's here in the home with us. What are the next steps you would want to see us taking? Or indeed, even if it is an elderly dog that's been rescued and adopted because they come with their own problems. So yeah, excellent question, one I wish that more dog owners would ask. Uh, for the first couple of weeks you're going to be getting your dog used to its surroundings and its new owner and getting them used to you and you used to them, the name, the recall and that kind of thing. But for puppies in particular, uh, but also young dogs, during this lockdown period nobody's had a chance to attend dog training classes, people have been trying to do the best they can on their own but it's not quite the same as dog training and also dogs are not being socialised enough as well. Now when we say socialise, we don't just mean putting a load of dogs together and letting them run round. Dogs learn from one another, they learn how to read dog body language and that kind of thing. Um, and when dogs are poorly socialised, that's when we usually see the results of dogs attacking other dogs in parks and open spaces or being fearful of people and then attacking because they're fearful. So the things I would recommend really are training and socialisation of your dog. Well Mark, I think that's very good advice and I, I think that the training is particularly important if you've never had a dog before because you need to know how to control it in all situations, the home and outside. But thinking about Wandsworth Parks and the number of dogs we now have, what do you think you could say to the council about the best, best way to manage dogs in our parks? Where are we allowed to, to let the dogs roam? where we've got to keep them on leads. What are the rules that people should be aware of? Right, so in our parks and open spaces, most of them, are, or in fact all of them, are governed by public space protection orders. But to make that more simple to understand, most of our parks and open spaces, you can let your dog off the lead to run free. Uh, however, in places like ones of Park, where we're stood next to the cafe area, which is fenced, the bowls area, the play playground, those, do those areas are off limits to dogs. Dogs are not allowed in them. So it's only out in the general area of the park. And that's the same for most of our parks and open spaces. There is a maximum number of four dogs that can be walked by any one person at any time. That's throughout the borough, uh, except in parks and open spaces where they run a multiple dog walking license. So for people that walk dogs as a profession or people that breed dogs perhaps or have very large, a very large sort of <laughs> troop of dogs at home, um, they can apply for a license from the council to walk those dogs in parks and open spaces. On the public highways, all dogs have to be kept on leads all the time and the maximum number is four again. And throughout the borough, everybody should be picking up their dog waste and disposing of it safely. 
So Mark, could I just ask you to exemplify a little more on why we must pick up dog waste? What, what are the health risks associated with dog waste? The main concern with dog waste is a tiny little microorganism called Toxicara canis which is found in some dogs that aren't wormed properly, but it's also found prevalently in puppies and bitches that are carrying puppies as well. Uh, it's easy to, to address in terms of the dog, it's just some simple medication from the vets, but it's passed by the dog, or through the dog, by its feces. Now, if those feces are ingested, then it can cause a lot of problems for humans. It's a zoonotic disease, which means that we will become very ill from it. So it's a microparasite that will find its way through the lining of your stomach, attach itself to one of your organs, and it will insist there for up to 20 years. Now, of course, we don't go around ingesting dog feces by design. But if you think about Wands of Park, for example, we've got children playing football here, and if the football rolls into the dog mess, okay, kids tend to pick it up, wipe the ball clean, and carry on. Children are also renowned for not washing their hands. You know, loads of parents out there will identify with that. Wash your hands, wash your hands. But it's a very easy way to ingest this microorganism and can make you ill. So again, if treated early in humans, it's, uh, it, you can recover from it. But it can be quite serious. It can give you uh, lung problems, heart problems. In very, very young children, it can be fatal. And that is why we're so concerned about picking up our dog's mess and disposing of it safely. And I need to emphasize the safely bit. It's uh, not good enough just to put it into a bag and then leave it on a tree or a bush or on the floor for somebody else to pick up. It needs to go into a bin so that nobody else can come into contact with it. Uh, so Mark, I've just got one more question. Sure. It's a little bit of a sadness really to have to report this, but of course dogs are not the only animals and wildlife in our parks. And there have been some unfortunate incidents recently of dogs attacking swans, particularly in Battersea. Um, what would you say to owners about this? How can they prevent that happening? How, I mean, I doubt they can give their dogs respect for swans, but how would they, how would they control the dog to make sure that other wildlife is safe around them. So there's a couple of things that we can do as dog owners. First of all, the recall, the training of the recall is essential. Uh, if you can see your dog going into the, the pond or going towards the wildlife, we should recall it and bring it back under control. Now that's easy to say, sometimes dogs get fixated with what they're chasing and training goes out of the window. If you know that your dog has a propensity to chase the wildlife, then the simple thing to do is keep it on the lead, don't go near it. Don't go near the lake or the pond if you know your dog is going to run in and chase the ducks or the swans or things like that. Stay away from the trees if you think your dog's gonna chase the squirrels. And if you can see the wildlife around, put your dog on the lead, it's fairly simple. The other thing I would just add there though is to be very careful around swans. Swans look very dainty, but they're actually very dangerous animals. And I've known of in my time a couple of cases where swans have killed dogs in, because the dog has gone into the pond and threatened them in some way. And the way they do this is they actually jump on the dog's back and flap their wings. Now the pressure that they can generate through those wings pushes the dog underneath and they keep going until the dog stops wriggling, which ultimately means it's a fatal ending. So I'd be very cautious as well. If you have small breed dogs, do not let them chase swans for your own dog's sake. Well, thank you, Mark. It's been great meeting you today. And just to end, I would say that the adoption site of the RSPCA for dogs is 500% up. We know that you're all interested in helping dogs at the moment. We know that you're all interested in owning dogs, but what we want to make sure is that it's done responsibly and humanely and that you and the dog are happy.